All right, everyone, it looks like our Zoom has started, so we will go ahead and get started in here as well. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Christine Calgar. I'm the Director of Member Engagement here at the Reno Sparks Chamber. Hello to our Zoom audience as well. It's wonderful to have you. Um, it's, it's great to be at the 2021 Health and Wellness Fair. Uh, we're trying something brand new, doing three different venues. Uh, an outdoor venue with COVID-19 vaccines and a workout class. Um, this venue um, for main stage sessions, which you're part of right now, and then also our training here, which is filled with food. So if you're on Zoom and have the ability to come down and see us today, please do. You're more than welcome. Otherwise, it's great to have you online. And for those of us who have joined us in person, thank you so much for being here, for taking time to invest in health and wellness in the workplace. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Amanda Negrini. Is that correct? Um, with Northern Nevada, Northern Nevada Medical Group. My brain is not fried or anything, I promise. Um, and she is going to talk to us this morning about building healthy habits in the workplace. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for having me join you today. Um, topic of today is building healthy habits in the workplace, which I think is something that's probably really important to everybody. There's been a lot of research and background about this and the importance of keeping your employees healthy and safe that helps your business as well. So we're going to get right into it. Some things that we're going to discuss today. Introduction, obviously, I'm going to introduce myself and give you a little bit of background on myself first. What is a healthy workplace kind of defined by the World Health Organization? Starting a workplace wellness plan how to get started with this wellness plan and what the best practices that have been recognized through some years of research are and some question and answer time. So myself, a little bit about me, I'm actually homegrown. So I'm from Sparks, Nevada. I was born and raised here. I did all of my medical training um, here as well. So I went through UNR and then the University of Nevada School of Medicine and then completed my residency in family medicine in 2013. I joined Northern Nevada Medical Group as a family medicine physician right after I graduated and I've been with the group since then. Um, I still see patients in a full-time clinical practice and then I also take on the role of medical director as we continue to grow our practice and um, support our area as it's grown so much as you know. So, <laughs> Um, healthy workplace, how is this defined? A place where everyone works together to achieve an agreed vision for the health and well-being of workers and the surrounding community. It provides all members of the workforce with physical, psychological, social, and organizational conditions that protect and promote health and safety. It enables managers and workers to increase control over their own health and to improve it and to become more energetic, positive, and contented. I think we all recognize that in life, we, we need to feel productive, we need to work, and we need to feel valued. And so we're gonna go through some of the, the important pieces of this when you're building a workplace um, health plan to help keep your employees healthy, happy, and active. So what does this mean? We're gonna break it down here a little bit more. Is the workplace safe? So there's a lot of things to consider with this. Are there a lot of accidents and injuries or is there a lot of potential for accidents and injuries? Work-related illnesses, exposures, this is kind of a hot topic right now, obviously in healthcare with COVID. Burnout, a very real problem across many industries. And workplace violence, that's something to consider depending on the industry that you're working. Is your organization high stress? Um, I think by a show of hands, who has a high stress organization? So almost everybody in the room, if on Zoom, you can't see that. Uh, and I think that's, of course, relative. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but work, workplace stress contributes a lot to our overall health. Now, I'm coming at this from the perspective of family medicine and what I see in my clinic and deal with on a daily basis. And I'll tell you, I see a lot of patients who are very stressed by their jobs, which then contributes to their health, which then becomes more of my issue that I deal with. So I'll go more into that. Um, as a business owner or as a man in a management role, do you know the percentage of your employees that have a chronic health condition? Something I think is really important to keep in mind is over 50% of Americans have at least one chronic health condition and 25% or more have at least two. And these play a big role in how well your corporation or your group can operate. Um, when, you have, when you have employees who are dealing with chronic issues, they may have more absenteeism, 
there may be other stressors that come into play when you're trying to manage that. So keeping that in mind and having a good idea of your population is important. Do you have a high rate of absenteeism, grievances, turnover? Those can be signs of high stress organizations. Those can be signs of kind of the cycle repeating itself and how can we fix that? So a healthy workplace. There are many factors that contribute to this. Generally speaking, there's three core areas to help promote a healthy workplace. Employee health should be defined as both or all three, physical, mental, and social. Those things are really important. We're gonna break those down more in a minute. A healthy organization is reflected in how you function as a business. When your clients, customers, whatever industry you're in, come in, how do those, how do those employees that are facing the public seem and it kind of, you know, everyone gets an idea as far as that goes, a smile on their face. Do they look stressed? Are they having a good day, bad day? All those factors play a role in how their health reflects in your business. The workplace must promote and protect health. This is a really, really key tenant. So how do you even start? It seems kind of overwhelming. You have to kind of assess where your employees are at, like I said. So survey your employees and see how well they think you are doing at creating a healthy work environment for them. Sometimes I think the answers will probably surprise you in what employees might be concerned about versus what management, management might be concerned about. And so really having a good pulse on where your employees stand with this and helping create based on that list where you need to go is important. Assessing your business as a leadership team, what are some good and bad or some healthy and unhealthy things that you, saw, that you see, you know, compare this with some of the surveys and that can help give you an idea of where your, where your business is operating and running as far as this goes. What do or don't you offer staff to create a healthy workplace? Are there healthy snacks available? We'll get a little bit more into some of those options too. Healthy snacks, activity levels, is there, are there mental health resources? All these things are really important considerations, especially in today's world. If you start with building a list of the strengths and the weaknesses within your own organization, this can help you really start to focus in on what's important. So questions to consider. I alluded to this a little bit on the last slide. If access to a primary care provider is not easy, your provider or your workers will be unable to treat illnesses or chronic conditions. So going back to 50%, of the population in America has a chronic illness that needs to be managed on some level by a primary care provider. This is a really important thing to consider. I mean, just within our community alone, as you all know, we've grown tremendously over the last 10 years. And the access, the access is not, not great, just in general. I mean, you're, we, we don't have enough primary care to support the growth of our community. And even with, with growing physician extenders, um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, trying to expand access to primary care. We still don't have enough and people are still booked out six weeks to try to deal with acute things that may come up. There's just not enough access. And so this is something to consider, not that you can necessarily do anything about that, but knowing that your, your employees may not have great access to primary care and how this impacts their health which then impacts their ability to be present at work is really important. And of course, for me being in primary care, I wanna prevent illness. I don't want a patient to come and see me after they've already developed diabetes. I want them to see me when they're pre-diabetic so that I can counsel them on, hey, let's get you active. Let's change your dietary habits. Let's help fix this problem before you come in to see me with an out of control blood sugar and changes in your eyes and other complications that can come with not managing these sorts of illnesses. So just helping, being aware that it's important to access primary care. If there's not a safety plan for avoiding injury at work, can an employee feel safe while doing their job? So there's a lot of research that if an employee feels that their work atmosphere is unsafe, that contributes then to their stress levels. And with higher stress levels, chronic conditions tend to flare more they tend to be out of work more, they tend to be ill more, and that all contributes to the function of your business. And so just trying to make sure that you reduce stress levels as much as you can. And if that's 
through having very good safety plans. We're gonna get into that a little bit more. I don't wanna to jump too far ahead, but having good safety plans in place so that your employees feel safe and supportive. That's a good goal. If there's no opportunity to take a break during a shift, when will an employee have a time to regroup? So I think this is important. And of course, we're all relegated to required break times. Whether or not those truly happen in practice is, is across the board. But break time is really important for employees' mental health. And mental health is a huge contributor, as we said in the first slide, there's three major things. And mental health is one of those. Stress, not having time to themselves, to, to remove themselves from whatever work situation it is, and have time to socialize as well. Socialization among most employees is really important, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. If the person's role is too difficult to manage, will they experience high stress and eventually poor health? Well, so this is taking a closer look at person's job description, what's actually expected of them, making sure that there's good support from above and at their level amongst their coworkers and supervisors. The health and well-being of your workers contributes to a high-performing organization, right? The whole reason that we're here, the whole reason that we're talking about this. When your employees are healthy, when your employees are happy, when there's a healthy, happy workplace for them, that reflects in how well your business operates and how well your business is perceived by your patrons. So things to consider on this improvement front, physical work environment, psychosocial considerations, personal health, community involvement. These are four things that we're gonna dive into a little bit more right now. So the physical work environment, ensuring your work environment is safe and supports your team. Reducing exposure to occupational hazards, following OSHA regulations, really important. Um, developing a smoke-free campus. There's obviously a lot of research as we move forward about the impacts of secondhand smoke on general health. Um, those sorts of things are really important to consider. Exposures, healthcare, COVID, appropriate, what we call PPE, personal protective equipment. You know, from our stance, that was a big stressor in the beginning of the pandemic. We didn't have enough N95s, and N95s are you know the best mask to help filter the air to a 95th percentile as far as reducing COVID transmission. And there wasn't enough of those, and you didn't always know what was walking into your office. So not only talking about us as medical providers, but our front office receptionists and anyone else in that circle of patient care was really impacted by this. And so talking about just in general, looking at an overhaul of your business and seeing where there might be exposures to chemicals, smoke as discussed, and other hazards that can be reduced to help set your employees more at ease. Provide regular training to your staff so they know all safety expectations and how to report concerns. And so this is gonna vary depending on your business, but again, having a good idea of where safety risks may be. Um, some studies have shown that when, when your employees are under a lot of stress, they're more likely to be not necessarily in, a, in an accident, but they won't necessarily follow all safety protocols when they're very stressed, right? You don't think straight when you're stressed, and then you were more likely to have an accident, which then creates more fear amongst that employee and others. So making sure that there's safe spaces and that you have procedures in place and regularly practicing these procedures. If there's dangerous chemicals that are at your corporation, making sure that there are regular safety drills to keep everyone fresh on those skills and to have open access to discuss any concerns that may arise. If there could be an exposure or an accident, how do you react to that? How do you minimize the harm that can happen to others? Um, Ongoing training opportunities, again, so that everyone knows how to support each other and knows how to continue to be safe within the work atmosphere. Psychosocial considerations. So this is something that I see a lot of in primary care. Again, going back to the stress, I feel like I'm beating it like a drum, but it's the thing I see so often. I mean, so often I'm writing FML paperwork for patients because their work atmosphere is so toxic for them that they need to be able to have those breaks. Um, so I just feel like this is a really, really big deal. This is a really big portion of this whole thing. Reward and recognize your employees often. Uh, I think we all, we all love a pat on the back. It doesn't always have to be 
something financial. It doesn't always have to be those sorts of things. While those are very nice and people do obviously really appreciate those gestures, you know, having some sort of regular recognition and reward process set up for your employees helps create a positive atmosphere, helps create um, a desire to work harder, of course, and all those things then promote the health and function of your business. Looking at the workload and making adjustments, especially if someone returns to work after an illness or injury, um, you know, you have a spectrum of employees, right? You have your, your hardest working who is always on point and never misses a beat and is always willing to take on more. And then you have your, your other end of the spectrum, of course. And so I think it's important. What I took from this when I was kind of looking through all this literature and getting ready for today was it's important to recognize that you always need to reevaluate someone's workload and job. They may be the highest functioning employee that you have. They may end up sick. They may end up with a family emergency, et cetera. You need to reevaluate the workload and not continue to load things on people. It's important for their general health, for their stress levels, for their for their function. So um, allowing for opportunities to provide constructive feedback to employees and encourage an open dialogue. And this is really just saying you need to have good management systems in place so that people feel comfortable coming to their direct supervisor and their managers and that there's open lines of communication so that your employees don't necessarily feel picked on or, um, you know, like they're being talked down to those sorts of things because then they're less likely to be able to come to you and feel comfortable coming to you to talk about other issues, either in their workload, maybe in the safety or other things that we've talked about thus far that are important. We want to build a culture that supports in this and regularly reviews policies to ensure that workers are protected. Um, at the end of the day, we don't have a business without employees, right? And, and we were just having this conversation. I mean, in the healthcare industry right now, we are almost in crisis mode as far as our support staff. I mean, I talked about there being a lack of providers to take care of patients, but there's also a, not enough assistive staff. So our front office workers, our medical assistants, and the workload on them can be absolutely tremendous at times. And so making sure that you're, you're keeping people happy and healthy and not overworking them is really, really key to helping your business function because you don't have a business without employees, typically. Personal health. So evaluate the personal health of your staff and offer solutions to help improve their health. Again, this is where my heart is, keeping everyone healthy. Integrate fitness into your workplace. Whether or not this means putting in a Peloton in your break room or having some sort of nice open area around your business where your employees can go and walk but just promoting that. And along with that comes incentive programs. You know, there's a lot of businesses that have incentive programs for promoting general health, whether or not it's a targeted, if you're height or weight or BMI or those things, or whether or not it's steps goals, um, competitions amongst the employees to help promote physical activity and health can really help motivate people to do those things, which in turn really reduces stress levels and increases happiness. And the exercise is a natural antidepressant. And so increasing your serotonin and norepinephrine and the chemicals in our brains that make us happy through exercise is a great way to improve the way that your business is operating. If your employees are more happy, again, your, your business works better. Um, healthy choices. So reevaluating what's offered in the vending machines and, and looking at the options available. Not that you need to force anyone's hand and everyone needs a cookie sometimes, but having more healthy options available for your employees is a really good way to move. Um, you know, smoking, smoking levels, of course, have gone down over the years as we've learned more and more, but there's still a pretty decent size of the population that are actively smoking. And this alone is a huge, huge contributor to multiple chronic illnesses, cancers, and deaths. And so, you know, evaluating your business, again, if you have a younger group, this may not be an area to focus your energy. And I'm not saying that younger people are not smokers, but probably a smaller proportion of 20s, 30s versus maybe 60s, 50s, 60s, you might have more of those um, employees that you can target to help with this. 
mental health counseling resources. Right now, we are in a crisis as far as this goes as well. I mean, add high stress work to COVID and isolation and no social outlets. And people are hanging on by threads and I see it every single day. And so making sure that there are resources available to your employees to help benefit their mental health because they can't, you know, when depression gets bad and people can't get out of bed. And I don't, I think sometimes it's hard. Um, my husband has a really hard time conceptualizing the idea of what depression looks like. And I think for people who've never suffered from depression, that can be a difficult thing to imagine, but I have seen it at its worst and it's devastating for people. And the, you know, the employee that's calling in every day that you might be just thinking, what's going on with this person? They just don't want their job, you know, and getting frustrated, being able to kind of pull the cover back and recognize they might be in crisis. They might not literally be able to get themselves out of the bed because of the other things going on at home, because of other stressors at work. So having those resources widely available to your employees is really invaluable. And I kind of talked about the last one, you know, promote or Promotional programs incentivize your employees to get active, to be healthy, to work on weight loss, to work on just being more out and about. Community involvement. So this is an important tenant as well, um, because being more involved in your community gives also a different sense of fulfillment. It's different than going to work every day and making money and being productive. Being involved in your community feels like giving back. And that's something that people sometimes have a hard time um, going out and doing and finding opportunities on their own. And so creating programs through your um, organization where you can promote more of this can be very beneficial to, to your employees' and mental health as well and their social connection. So engaging your team in initiatives that support a healthy community starting a, a volunteer committee at your business to engage your staff with community projects that contribute to healthier neighborhoods. So park cleanups, nonprofit walks or runs, plant trees, those sorts of things. We, uh, as a medical group, we've been doing some of these. We've gone to the food bank, we've gone to the Humane Society and trying to promote um, those sorts of activities can be really beneficial. Support your staff and recognize your staff who want to serve on local boards and community groups and extend their, their reach and the things that they can do. Re rewarding them, as I talked about, and setting up fundraisers or a corporate challenge with neighboring businesses, you know, things that help us feel connected. And, and I think inherently, as doing that as part of a business, that gives your employees a sense that you, and a sense and a reality that you care. And that's really important. I think working for an organization where you feel like it's not just to them about the money they make from you or make off of you, but that they care and give back to the community gives people a better sense of fulfillment, getting up and going to work every day. So key takeaways from what we've talked about today and how to enact this for your group. Survey your staff, see what's important to them, to then create a plan to move forward. Build a plan that prioritizes what matters most to both your employees and your company. Consider the personal health of your staff. Again, looking at the spectrum and ratio of employees across all ages and you know, chronic illnesses, those are the things, important things to keep in mind. Leverage the research and knowledge of others who have built programs, right? Don't recreate the wheel. If there are other local businesses that you know have done a great job with this, tap them to help with ideas, things that have worked, things that haven't worked so that you can build this easily moving forward. Remember that physical health is not the only contributor to employee wellness. Social health, mental health, and the idea of safety is all really important when you're talking about employee wellness. And this is where we gathered the information from. Any questions for me? Okay. 